lecture. Uh, today's lecture is a, is a very interesting one. Uh, I will talk about two topics, uh, the immediate loading, digital immediate loading, of course, and the locking uh, surgical guides. I mean, you have uh, many guides that can interwine together to form uh, a larger guide. So uh, we'll start with a simple case, and then we'll proceed on with uh, more difficult cases until we can see how to uh, combine these technologies uh, together uh, at the same time in a, in a large full arch case. So let's start with our first case. It's an immediate temporization, no locking guides. It's just a normal surgical guide. Uh, I usually, or almost every case I work in a teamwork, uh, you cannot do cases uh, on your own, uh, unless it's very simple. So let's start this first case with my colleagues, Dr. Mohamed Abmanem, my brother, Dr. Khaled Ikram, Dr. Mr. Ibrahim Al Amari, and Dr. Basim Al Ashrafi. This, this was the team. So. Uh, we get a patient here. Uh, he's a middle-aged patient. He is medically free. He has a, he has a, a fractured crown of an upper lateral incisor. He wants to do it uh, in, the same, in the same visit, place an implant and do an immediate loaded uh, restoration. So this looks like a simple case. Uh, you, you, we get these cases every day in our offices. So, but requires or takes a lot of thinking to perform such a case. It's not as easy at, as we can see it. There are many stuff that we have to consider before doing such a case. So we have to assess uh, the risk in this area, especially it's an aesthetic zone. So we have to assess the risk. We are going to make an immediate placement uh, for an implant together with an immediate loading. Uh, it's, a, it's a high risk uh, case to do it. And in the aesthetic zone, you don't want to have uh, the papilla or the gingiva uh, uh, have recession and the case fails. It's not about just uh, placing an implant. It's also an aesthetic. Also, uh, aesthetics is very important. It's our main issue. So planning with the case starts always. We take photographs and so on. So taking the photographs, we have to decide. Is this a case, we look at the smile at first, is this a case of a high risk case or a low risk case? A high risk case means that when the patient smiles, you can see his gum, a lot of his gum, more than two or four millimeters of his gum, you can see it. While a low risk case, when the patient smiles, you can just see the teeth or a very uh, minimal area of the gingival tissues. So uh, fortunately, the case was a, a low risk case. He has no gummy smile. So this is, uh, this, is uh, this favors, us to do immediate loading and immediate placement. Next is the gingiva biotype. Is it a thin biotype or a thick biotype? A thin biotype means that you have a gingiva with two millimeter or less. Sometimes you can see the shadow of the teeth. So uh, fortunately also the case was a thick biotype. You have, you, you have a, the thick gingiva. So it's less likely to have a metal display of the implant when you place it in this aesthetic zone. So all of these factors decide if we are going to do an immediate loading or do more stuff like uh, free gingival grafts or do um, uh, soft tissue grafted uh, bone grafting and so on. We have the comb beam CT, of course. We are going to place an implant. We have to take a comb beam CT. And so we have to evaluate the amount of bone uh, around the root. Does it require bone grafting or not? Is it type one where we have good bone, type two, moderately uh, resorbed bone, or type three where the bone loss is severe? So in this case, also, we had a type one bone. We don't need to do bone grafting. You have many types of uh, socket classification, what we call the sagittal classification. We decided to see it also so it's a type one, meaning that the root is more to the labial plate of bone. That means that we are going to place the implant palatally away from the socket. And this requires a lot in directing. It's very difficult to, to redirect our drill away from the empty space of the socket. So uh, knowing this, we must use a surgical guide. It's, in my opinion, it's highly recommended or a must in cases of socket type one, because as you go with the drill without a surgical guide, usually the drill will be taken in the empty space. It will be guided by the socket space. We don't want to do this. We want to go palatal where we have enough or more bone. 
So knowing all this info, we are we took the decision to, to do immediate placement with immediate loading. Okay, we have to figure out uh, the mesiodistal uh, bone available, papilla, and so on, to be able to place it uh, as the guidelines uh, 1.5 millimeters or 2 millimeters from each neighboring tooth to get uh, the papilla uh, um, regenerated correctly. So let's talk about concepts of digital planning. Okay, we have three, three uh, subjects we have to talk uh, uh, about first before proceeding to our case. Uh, first subject is a digital patient, second is a reverse bioengineering, and third is a prosthetic driven plan. Let's uh, start talking about these three, uh, uh, these three technologies. The digital patient, what do we mean by the digital patient? If you're going to treat a patient in a conventional way, you have to have your patient live. You have to look at the patient, tell him smile. You can see the, the, the gingiva, you can see the teeth. Uh, of course, in the bone, you will, you will see it using an X-ray, like a comb beam CT or, or so. But to do a conventional way of treatment, you have to get the patient in person and see him and examine him. This is how it goes. To have the patient digital, to do digital planning, you have to see the patient digital on the computer, meaning you have to get his skin on the computer, his smile, uh, his teeth, jaw, his gums, uh, uh, his bone. So you have to combine all of these factors, uh, all of these uh, structures together, same as the patient. So to do this, we take records and do what we call registration. As you can see here, the, we have we have no modality that you can get here the jaw bone the gingiva and the teeth in just one exposure name it ultrasound comb beam CT uh, multi slice CT MRI nothing gets this view of the gingiva teeth and bone such as clear or with the skin you cannot get uh, this uh, view so what can we do to get a virtual uh, patient or a digital patient. We can get each modality separately and then combine them or what we call it a registration. You put the points and you register. For example, here, uh, this is my brother, Dr. Khaled Ikram and, I'm, and my partner. Uh, I wanted to give an example. You can get his bone by the uh, comb beam CT or multi-slice CT in this, uh, this, this is the comb beam CT. You can get the gingiva and also the teeth with an optical scan either an uh, intraoral optical scan or a, or a lab or with or taking an impression and putting the cast in the lab scanner. And you can get the photo by many, uh, many ways. Uh, simplest is to take a, a photographic, uh, to, uh, to shoot a photograph with your DSLR camera, or you can use a facial scanner uh, or a stereophotogrammetric uh, camera. This is not our topic. Uh, I just wanted to say that we can get each structure by a different method. So we have here a Combium CT, we have the cast, we have the photo, we can combine them together. And there you go, you have the digital patient here, you can combine the Combium with the cast, having the gingiva by using common registration points. We have here the bone and the teeth. Uh, in the cast, we have the gingiva and the teeth. The teeth is a common object. So you can choose the same common object, same points, and then you combine it, uh, you combine them together and you will have here the comb beam CT, the teeth, and the gingiva. Same with the facial scan. You have the photo and you have the soft tissue mode of the comb beam CT, soft tissue filter. Uh, you can use, you can take uh, similar landmarks, whatever in the face, the cancers of the eye, nasion, uh, filtrum, uh, any landmarks, and you can just do what we call photo wrapping. Of course, if, if you have a facial scanner, it's better. If you have a stereo photogrammetric uh, camera, it's, it's better and better. Finally, we get what we call the digital patient. So if you are going to make a plan, whatever is for immediate loading or for anything else, you have to do the, you have to combine the digital patient or what we call the digital assembly. You have to get these structures together. Uh, second issue is what we call a prosthetic driven plan. When you're going to do planning for implants, 
you have to think of the prosthesis or the restoration first of all. You do not think of the implant. So this is an example where I can choose the best parts of the bone and put the implants. And if you see the prosthesis afterwards, you will find this view. You have your implants in the contacts and embrasures. Uh, this is a disaster for the prosthodontist. You cannot, ha you cannot have these implants in that position. So what is meant? This is called a bone born plan. We do not do this. We, we do a prosthetic driven plan, meaning you put your restoration first, then you put your implants. Somebody may ask me, what about if the bone was not uh, enough? You graft it. You can put angled implant. You do what you, what you have to do. But always remember, you have to start with your prosthesis. You have to start with your restoration. Then an implant patient is coming to your office to place a restoration, not to do a surgery or place an implant. He's going for the crown or the uh, bridge or whatever restoration he's, he's going to do. So we can call it prosthetic driven plan. Some people call it the VIP protocol, and not, of course, not very important person. It's a virtual implant prosthetic protocol. Of course, uh, you can, if, it's, if it is a full arch case, you have to adjust the parallelism of the implants as well as, as, well as the prosthetic driven plan. So what if I want to place we, we said we want to place the crown first. So according to what standard are we going to place the crown? We are going to place the crown according to the opposing occlusion. So this is called a, a, a reverse engineering process, meaning if you want to place implants in the maxilla here and you have the cast, you cannot just place an implant right away. No, what you can do is first, you place the opposing occlusion in, in the same relation then you place your crown here. After you place your crown, you just place your implant. So you start away from your uh, target. Our target is the implant. No, we will start with the opposing and then we can put our, um, uh, our crown, our opposing crown, our crown, and then put the implant. As you can see here, this is not, this is not the best place for the implant to be placed in bone. It's inclined but it's the best place for implant to be placed according to the restoration which we uh, we had okay had some lectures uh, before so uh, during this uh, study always group, remember uh, this is uh, uh, a bone prosthetic plan a bone driven plan and this is a prosthetic driven plan you can see here the implants are placed in the ideal position of bone but if you look at the restoration on the left side you will see that it has no passive insertion uh, it's, uh, it's away from our prosthesis totally. So we always do a prosthetic driven plan using a reverse engineering process. Back to our case. So knowing all of this info, all of this planning, we evaluated the case clinically. Let's proceed on to how we are going to treat it. This is a preoperative x-ray. As we can see, he's not a high risk case. He has no gummy smile. He has a thick biotype. Uh, uh, the socket type one classification from the combium CT. So we don't need grafting, so we can proceed doing the immediate loading and immediate implant. Okay, here, here are the photos. We started by getting an optical scan of the upper jaw and the lower jaw, and we, uh, we can combine them in occlusion, a third scan, and we can register to get the uh, upper arch with the opposing lower arch in the same uh, in the same position as in the patient's mouth. Next, we have to see the uh, the root lengths. Okay, we have a longer root; it's about 12 millimeters. So that means you will only have a primary stability maximum by three or four millimeters, and this requires the bone to be hard bone, not soft bone. In the maxilla, usually, usually the bone is D3. Uh, that's why we took the decision that we are going to use osteodensification technique using the densa burrs. Uh, we are already taking a very small portion uh, of the bone to do immediate placement and immediate loading. This is a high risk. So I wanted to densify the bone first to make, to increase my, uh, or to decrease my risk factors. You can have better bone. 
So our choice of the implant was uh, an implant 3.5 by 15 millimeters. Okay. Second, we did a, a, a digital smile design. Of course, it's just a single tooth, but you, you still do a digital smile design, especially in the lower uh, jaw. Uh, it's very important to have an aesthetic uh, plan and you show it to the patient and he can approve it. So uh, everything is okay. Here is the digital smile design. We did it on uh, the ExoCAD software. As you can see, this is the tooth we wanted to, to place, okay? We, we try to place it away from occlusion. We don't want to have forces uh, on an implant that is just have four, to, uh, four or three millimeters of bone and immediately loaded. We don't want to have any forces, so we put it out of occlusion. Here you are. And we did the registration of this complex, the wax up and the upper cast, the lower cast to the CBCT here. And we are going now to place our implant virtually on the CBCT. Okay. So we placed our implant. Uh, remember, this is uh, this is uh, this is an aesthetic zone. You want to place your implant as palatal as you as you can because you want to leave about three or two millimeters at least of buccal bone, so as not to have bone resorption at the end. Also, a second, a second reason to place the implant palatal is that you want to put your screw palatal. You don't want to screw, uh, your screw to emerge from the labial bone, from the labial tooth surface. So we have to put the screw palatal. So the implant was put in palatal direction uh, towards bone away from the socket, which is type one. And we have here the plan like this. Okay, as you can see here, there is the implant and the screw is emerging palatal and still the patient will have his uh, labial surface intact without any uh, modifications. Uh, we faced another problem. The problem is a narrow mesiodistal space. We want to place our uh, sleeve for the guide, but the, the space was narrow. Now I have two options. Uh, either uh, I'm going to work sleeveless. I don't like to work sleeveless. Sometimes it's not very accurate, especially with 3D printing. Maybe with CAT cam, it's more accurate, but with 3D printing, uh, sleeveless guides, uh, I don't recommend it very much. Some people like it, it's no problem. It's not my personal preference. So we used a pilot drilling and anyway, we are going to use a dense bit afterwards. So I used a pilot sleeve instead, and then uh, I will go through with the dense bit. Here is the surgical guide design, and here is the guide after printing with the pilot sleeve, okay? What's interesting is how can we uh, how we can do immediate loading afterwards. You don't need you don't need to take a second impression. If you put the implant and you are going to place the implant accurately, you have here in the library of the software. This software was called the Real Guide software. Uh, this is a scan body, okay? So we have the scan body, or you can have the, your T base uh, directly. Uh, uh, on the computer, so you don't need to have an impression. You just need to place the implant as accurate as possible to get the, to get the same exact position of the TBs inside the patient's mouse. So we have the implant, we have the scan body virtually, or we have the TBs, doesn't matter. And we can start designing a temporary restoration here, okay, without having to take an impression. We don't need an impression in this case. So uh, make sure that the uh, palatal, uh, the, the screw channel is palatal, okay? And the case was milled with PMMA, okay? Let, so to revise again what we did, we did the registration of the cast on the CBCT, we, uh, cast and the opposing. We did a digital smile design and placed a wax up. We placed an implant palatal with palatal screw channel. We have our T-base or scan body on the software. Then we can design for the screw retained prosthesis, place a surgical guide, put the implant, make the drilling. We are, and we are going to use dense suburbs. And then we can place the implant, place the abutment, and finally, place your restoration in a single visit.
this is the denser berg. I'm doing osteo densification. Of course, we had to do some little adjustment because uh, the the implant was not placed through the guide, and this was a disadvantage. But everything went went well with a minute minute adjustment, and we could place the restoration here, as we can see, as planned exactly. If you can see the bite of the patient away from occlusion and the uh, immediate, we have, can see here the aesthetic. We can see here. Post-operative, we have about uh, two and a half millimeters of uh, bone. So we achieved the target and it was successful. Uh, so this is our first simple case. And as you can see, it looks simple, but it has a lot of planning. We did a lot of planning for just to place a, a single implant. And here is the super imposition of the pre and post uh, planning. You can see here the implant planned and uh, the, the one here, the... Uh, in brown is the implant actually planned, so we have a good accuracy in planning. Okay, and this is the immediate temporary restoration. I don't do immediate loading with a final zirconia restoration, of course. This is very harmful to bone, and it has, uh, and it has a high success, a high uh, failure rate. Uh, I don't do this. I just do immediate temporization until the bone uh, heals, and I can then put my final restoration after with progressive loading, of course. So another issue is the immediate loading. Uh, immediate loading, I consider it a risk. So I always uh, think about some uh, stuff be before doing immediate loading. First of all, I have to get, I have to gain a primary stability of at least 35 to 40 Newton centimeters. In this case, the implant was placed with 50 Newton centimeters. So uh, it was good. <sighs> I don't, I'm not in favor uh, of placing uh, immediate loading in D3 or D4 bone, unless I do densification. So uh, unless I'm not going to densify the bone, I don't do immediate loading. I only do immediate loading in D1 or D2 bone. I can do it in D3 bone if I do densification of bone. Uh, third, I do uh, non-functional loading, uh, progressive loading, meaning that you have to uh, put the implant and uh, start gradual loading on it, uh, tell the patient to eat soft food first for a time, uh, and then start increasing the forces. You can start with soft food, uh, then, uh, then the meat, and followed by vegetables at a period of two months. Uh, I don't do functional loading. I like to put it out of occlusion. Unless it's a full arch case, I have no choice. OK. Uh, it's not favorable to do immediate loading in patients with bone problems like uh, uh, diabetes uh, or uh, problem in the um, metabolism of bone, smokers, and patients with parafunction. So, of course, in the aesthetic zone, the gingival, bi the gingival biotype should, should be a uh, thick biotype uh, and low patient uh, smile line. Uh, if he has a gummy smile, it will be uh, a high, it will have a higher risk of exposing or gingival recession, and of course, good periodontal condition. Uh, it's not a contraindication to place immediate implants um, in cases other than these, but it's my favorable uh, personal preference to do this. Uh, of course, the bones should be healthy, uh, and I do I do not do immediate loading with immediate placement in multi-rooted teeth. So let's get, uh, let's do more cases, okay? Let's see more cases. Uh, this case is not an immediate loading case, but it's what we call the locking guide. Uh, and we can relate to, uh, between immediate locking, loading and the locking guide at, uh, at, my, at the end of the lecture, where, where I can uh, show you a case. Uh, the cases with my colleagues as usual, Dr. Yusuf al and Dr. Ahmad Salah. And Dr. Khalid Ikram too. Dr. Ekram, I'm sorry, if, uh, before you start on this section, uh, we had a, a couple of questions on uh, social media. Uh, one is from Islam Sami Morsi. 
He wants to know, was that prosthesis a tie base non-hexed? No, uh, it's engaged. It's engaged, no problem. As long as it's a single tooth, it can be engaged. If you're doing multi-units, no, you have to make it non-engaged, of course. And then he also is asking, uh, how could you make sure that a hand-tightened implant receives a pre-milled restoration? Uh, it's not hand tightened. We had a, a torque wrench. It, it, uh, we can see the um, uh, the exact torquing. It was 50 newton centimeters. Okay. We, we placed it at first with a contra angle, motorized. Then we used final adjustment with the hand uh, wrench. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And hi, Doctor Islam. He's a friend of mine. <laughs> okay. The second case we have we had a female uh, patient. Uh, she wants to make an overdenture. We are not going to do immediate loading. She has an extremely thin knife edge ridge, as we can see here. Uh, we wanted to make a, a bone reduction instead of using bone grafting. And since she is going to place uh, an overdenture, we are not worried about the vertical dimension of occlusion because an overdenture, you can increase the vertical dimension, no problem. It would have been a problem if it was a fixed bridge. So it's okay to do bone re reduction rather than doing uh, augmentation. Of course, as usual, the prosthetic plan has to be done to see the position of the implants. Of course, it should the opposing arc should be considered. And here is the plan. We have a knife, uh, a thin knife edge ridge here and here. And the implant is placed submerged about five to maybe five millimeters, six millimeters here and here. Okay, so we are going to cut this part from the, um, uh, from the bone. We designed, after placing the implants, uh, uh, we designed what we called a bone reduction guide. You can either call it a bone reduction guide or a foundation guide. Uh, the difference, a bone reduction guide, we are going to use it to cut the bone. A foundation guide is a guide that is a base to the next guide. So uh, we can call it, uh, in this case, it's a bone reduction guide and also serves as a foundation guide. So next, as we can see, we designed here two male parts, what we call locks. We are designing them to design a counterpart, which, uh, which is a female part that can lock inside. So this is a, a bone reduction guide. We can see here fixation pins. I only used three fixation pins. It's a simple not very uh, difficult case. And we can do a virtual segmentation on bone, meaning that you have the bone in the CBCT and you can cut it at the level of the implant. You place the implant where you want and then you segment the bone at the same level of the implant. Then you design what we call the implant surgical guide with a female lock so that you can place the, the two locks together. Allows proper fixation. Can see here this is the lock it's slightly transparent so you can see the male part in the foundation or bone reduction guide and the female part here in the uh, implant guide next we can see here uh, these guides were printed and uh, this was uh, this was one of my first cases in bone reduction uh, implant guide so i wanted to print uh, i wanted to print them and test it uh, and i started doing this video you can see here, okay, this is a bone reduction guide. You can see it's open from the uh, from top and this is the implant guide and we want to place them and so that to make them click together. You want, you, you want to have them, you can see the locks here. This is a lock and this is a lock. Hear the sound? You, you hear this sound? It's a click. If you try to separate them, it will be very difficult. In my future cases, I stopped doing the clicking guides. I don't want to do the guides clicking because if you need to remove them for any reason, it will be very hard in, uh, in surgery. So I, I'm not doing locking guides like this anymore or clicking guides, I mean. I'm just doing guides with locks, male and female part, not, not clicking, not, not like so hard like this. So back to our case, we can see here the, the virtual plan. We place the implants. We place the pins. Okay, you can see the ridge here is very thin. Okay, extremely, it's a knife edge, edge ridge. Mm -hmm. 
okay? Then we did virtual segmentation of bone okay. at the level of the implants. We adjusted the path of insertion of both implants because it's an overdenture case. It's very important to adjust the path of insertion. And then we designed finally the implant surgical guide. So this is virtual on the computer. Here in surgery, the fixation guide or foundation guide with the locks placed, we did a bone reduction uh, guide, Dr. Yusuf al and Dr. Ahmad Salah. And then we removed this part. And by the way, this part, if you need any graft, you can use them. Don't throw them away if you need graft, of course. Then we uh, put the implants, we did the drilling and the implants this time were inserted through the guide. So this makes it more accurate, okay? And see here's the implant placed with the guide. And this is the final position of the implants. You can see how parallel they are, how well positioned they are in the ridge. You have uh, an enormous amount of bone buckle and the palatal and the, and this is uh, went very fine. Okay, you can see here, this is a post-operative X-ray, CBCT. Okay, I was very worried about this case because it was maybe my first case or second. So we did a, a post-op comb MCT and you can see here, both are parallel. And then if you can see a superimposition between the pre and post, you will see they are almost, are not 100% accurate, but almost. It's about 97, 98% uh, accurate and superimposed on the original plan. Okay, the locking guides in full arch cases. We are going to see more difficult case. Okay, uh, this case is was a difficult one. Uh, this is the, Dr. Ahmed El-Shal and Mr. Ahmed Anas, uh, my teamwork in the surgery. Okay, uh, this is a male patient. He had also a missing uh, lower arch. He's in a fully dentist and these uh, teeth on the uh, on, on the right hand side of your right hand were mobile and we, we, uh, we had to extract them. So the plan was performed as usual. But in this case, we have many, we had many bone defects here. And this was a problem. We will go and see what happened. Okay, we wanted to do bone reduction guide at this level and do virtual extraction. Prosthetic planning, of course, as usual. It was an all on four case, okay. Uh, segmentation of bone, virtual extraction, put the implant level, okay? And then this is the, uh, the proposed treatment plan that we are going to do. We did the bone reduction guide as usual, uh, did the segmentation, here is the guide and here is the printed guide, okay? And here is the implant guide, you can see the locks from the outside and this is from the inside, the, the female part. Okay, and this is the final design the final proposed design. Okay. Okay, as you can see from different angles, from different views, we wanted to do this reduction. Okay, we started by doing the extraction. Okay. We extracted all the teeth. Uh, we did an incision. It's uh, this is a bone uh, supported surgical guide. What is meant by bone supported surgical guide? It means that you have to put it uh, on bone. Uh, the bone is sub uh, the guide is supported by bone. You don't place it on the mucosa. You place it on the bone. Okay. This is incision. We, it was a little bit fibrous. Okay. We place the guide, we place the pins, okay? There was a problem and we did the, the bone reduction here. There was a problem on the left side of the patient. The patient had a huge cyst. We can see, we, we, we could see it on the CBCT, but it, uh, during surgery, during live surgery, it was huge. It was more than what we saw in the CBCT. So in implants, you always have to have a plan B. Uh, don't rely on your digital plan. You have to be an implantologist that you can deal with any situation and not depending on the surgical guide, as we did here. We couldn't gain primary stability on the left implant of the patient, this one, okay? 
And even the pin fixation was not very accurate because the bone was soft. I thought the bone would have been harder. So we changed the plan for this implant. We placed it like an all on four, but the implant on the left side, we placed it straight freehand. As you can see here, it's a huge defect. And of course, this defect was grafted. So this is an example where you have to, uh, to have a plan B. It's very important to have a plan B. You can see here, implant placement, and here is the, the defect, which was grafted and sealed, okay? You can see the cyst here, see the defect? It's huge, it's huge. This is the final position of the implants, and uh, loading was not performed the same day, of course. It's not an immediate loading case uh, because of this cyst. And in all in four, you have to be very careful. Just placing one wrong implant will make a very big problem in the future. Uh, case number three, I did it uh, in the in Dubai with Dr. Ihab Rashid and Dr. Khaled Akram, of course. Uh, Dr. Ihab is a very talented uh, surgeon. Uh, we also, the same case of the lower, I don't know why I get all the cases lower arch, I don't know, but this is what happens, okay? So again, it's a lower case for a, and a female patient. Uh, thin knife edge ridge. Now we know the protocol. I will go through. Uh, I will go through very fast. We did the prosthetic uh, planning. Place the implant. You. Uh, we have designed uh, the implant position. Then did the segmentation according to the implant crest. Okay. Again, we put the pins in sound bone. Design the bone reduction guide, and then on top of it is the implant guide. So, let's have a look at the surgery. Uh, this time the bone was reduced using a piezo, uh, uh, a piezo surgery a motor. Okay. Let's have a look at the plan at the same time. Okay, we'll go fast. Okay, this is fast forward. You have a huge amount of bone. We don't want to throw it. If you're going to place graft again, don't throw the bone. If you're going to do bone reduction, keep every inch of bone. Who knows, you might need it at the end of surgery. We don't know how, but it can be used, okay. So, let's go, let's go more, okay. So, okay, enough with the piece of surgery. You see this part of bone? It will be separated now. You can separate it. Yes, you can see here, we separated this part. Now you have the bone reduced. You can use a ronger or something to uh, make the bone smooth. Okay. See how, how we gained so much width here? It's huge. Otherwise, we would have done augmentation and we have to wait. Okay. These are the implant guide, locking guide also. And we can place it on top of the what we call bone reduction or foundation guide. Then we start drilling for the implants. Okay. Sometimes after bone reduction, you will find the bone harder because you are going more into the basal bone. So basal bone is harder than the uh, spongy bone at the top. So we'll find resistance in the drilling. You have to do a very good irrigation. Okay. Let's skip this. And then we place the implants. And Dr. Ehab decided to place two more implants freehand also. It's a type of flamby, okay? Uh, he found the bone good. He found the condition. He can, he can increase the number of implants. Uh, uh, so he did more, uh, two more implants. And I think he was, uh, he was right about taking this decision. This is a post-operative X-ray as we can see the parallelism here. As you can see, it's a very nice case. With no immediate loading. Uh, my last case is uh, the best one. Uh, we are going to use a, a full, we are going to do a full arch case, okay, all on four, with an immediate loading with many surgical 
guides. Okay, let's start our case. Uh, I did this case in the Future University in, uh, in Cairo with uh, my colleagues and my friends, Dr. Mohammed Dohim and Dr. Medhat Samah. Okay, so let's start. Okay, another case of the lower arch. Uh, we have a case of uh, periodontally affected uh, teeth. Um, a great two mobility maybe, uh, but we have we had D2 bone and this was very good to do an immediate load and a very good uh, not not a very good oral hygiene but uh, it's it's not very bad okay so we had the uh, upper and lower model we did the optical scans and did uh, another cut with a virtual extraction in the same relation and we put this on the articulator. A virtual articulator using ExoCAD also. We did uh, a wax up for the lower uh, arch. As you can see here, this is a virtual extraction on the cast, and this is the cast without virtual extraction. Uh, we placed the implants uh, according to the prophetic uh, plan uh, that we uh, performed on the articulator. And this time, you have to be meticulous with the wax up. It has to simulate the final restoration because the patient will use it. Uh, as, a, as a prosthesis. So you have to be meticulous with the restoration. So let's begin. Here we have what we call, this is not a bone reduction guide. This case was supposed to be performed or was performed flapless. We, we didn't have to do any bone reduction. So in this case, this guide at the top here is not called a bone reduction guide. It's just a foundation guide. It's a guide for the next guides. But we had a problem. You can put the, uh, the foundation guide straight or you can be a little bit tilted. So we had to perform what we call a reference guide, an occlusal reference guide. We used these teeth to make this guide here, uh, the one in blue, to fix the foundation guide in the exact place we planned. So uh, uh, this is, I called it a, a reference guide or occlusion reference guide, and we place it on top of the foundation guide. Then we, uh, we used a, a 3D printed mock-up with locks to verify that we are going on the right track. We don't want to place the implants and then find the occlusion different from what we have planned. So I did this mock-up uh, lock to make sure that we are going the right way. Otherwise, I could have changed the position again of the uh, foundation guide. Then we place an implant guide, the locking guide, to place implants, I will show the video. I know it's complicated, okay? And then we can do a final pickup with a, a, a mock-up, a 3D printed mock-up, which is uh, hollowed from the inside. So we have our occlusion reference guide. This guides what we call the foundation guide in place. We fix the foundation guide. We place the, the mock-up uh, and check occlusion. We place the implant guide, and finally, we place our immediate temporary restoration. So we have five uh, guides, or four guides and an immediate tempor uh, tempor uh, temporization restoration. Um, Dr. Akram, uh, if you don't mind me jumping in, uh, we have a question from uh, Livio Rakovita. He wants to know what prosthetic materials do you use for immediate and also for permanent prosthesis? Uh, for immediate, uh, I use, uh, it's, if it is milled, I use PMMA. It's printed, you can use uh, an FDA approved resin, okay, uh, from any company. Uh, if you want to place a final restoration, I don't, I don't do final restorations with immediate loading. I don't do this, okay? Maybe uh, some other colleagues are more brave or braver than me can do this. I don't do this. But if you're going to place a final restoration, depends on the case. If you're going to place a hybrid restoration, you can make a titanium meshwork, a titanium frame, uh, and zirconia above. Uh, you can make it peak with zirconia. You can make it um, uh, whatever you like. It's, there are many options. But mainly, titanium framework is the best, in my opinion, with zirconia uh, crowns. So let's see Thank our... Uh, welcome. Let's see our workflow. Here, we place the foundation guide. And then we we pushed the reference guide above it, okay, seated on teeth, and then we did we place the fixation pins here, okay, 
on the foundation guide. Now we have our foundation guide in place. We don't need the reference guide here. We take it away. Then this is what we can see here. You have the foundation guide. It's not a bone reduction guide and this will be done flapless, okay? We put the mock-up uh, with locks to the foundation guide just to check that we are going to on the right track. We want to feel safe and comfortable to continue the surgery and, and that we are not doing anything wrong. Next, we are putting here the implant surgical guide. Uh, we start drilling here in uh, an all in four case. Here we can see the, uh, the implant guide connected to the foundation guide and here is the drill. It's a keyless system using uh, sleeves. Uh, implant insertion through the guide which makes it more accurate and we can check the torque here. You see the torque here is about maybe 40-45 and we can check the parallelism on the multi-unit abutments. Of course this case was performed with a multi-unit abutments. You can see here the multi-unit abutments placed all parallel in a very nice position. Then we don't need this found, uh, uh, we still need the foundation guide. We still need it. Okay, you can see. Uh, what type of uh, abutments are these? Uh, these are temporary abutments. You see they have these serrations to lock to your pickup. So we placed it here. After placing it, we did uh, we inject some composite here, uh, did the pickup and removed the locks and you have your final temporary restoration, not the final restoration, you have your temporary restoration. Okay, so let's go through again before I show you the video. This is the case. This is the reference guide placed on the foundation guide. Now you have the foundation guide, you do extraction. Next, you have your mockup to verify. You have the surgical guide all locked to the foundation guide to do the drilling. You place the implant and you do the pickup. Let's see. Okay, this is the planning on the left and this is the surgery on the right. We place the reference guide here on top of the foundation guide. I used